Hi, Dave. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm so glad to be here. For my listeners, I'm welcoming Dave Dobson. He is a fantasy and sci-fi author, and he's here to tell us about his five books. Yeah, uh, happy to be here and uh, and talk about those. I, I've been looking into a couple of years, too. I'd be interested uh, in how you're doing uh, with different genres, because I've just written a thriller, too, and I've been mostly fantasy sci-fi. But I see you've done romance and fantasy and uh, dystopian sci-fi also, so. Right, yeah, I write in a couple of different genres in it. But it helps me because when I have my heavy dystopian sci-fi, it's way too heavy. Like as soon as I finish that book, I'm like, okay, I now I need to write a happily ever after romance, and that helps my <laughs> psyche get out of that place with those characters. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so mine are even within the books. They're a little bit of a, a crossover. My Inquisitors Guild books, which are up here, are sort of a detective mystery. Uh, stories, but they're set in a medieval fantasy setting. So there's magic and swords and all of that kind of stuff too. But the focus is actually on solving cases or mysteries that show up. So, oh, interesting. So, what type of mysteries? Uh, well, it's a different. Each uh, each book is a different sort of case. The first one, um, two inspectors are are following a jewel thief, and then he explodes, and they run into a wizard a sorceress who made them explode. And they try to figure out what she's doing and it leads them into a whole uh, sort of hidden cult and a, a scheming noble and that kind of thing. So, uh, but they're all set in the city of Frosthelm or close to it. So um, they're the investigative agency for the city. Um, and there's also a city guard and a military and that kind of thing. So it's, it's got this whole world associated with it. Oh, no. um, so you yeah. made your own world, it's set in medieval times what kind of tools do they have or do they use to investigate this is so they yeah that's a little bit limiting except that i gave them a big leg up they have this um thing called the augers pool in their headquarters which is sort of a crystal ballish you know they can look into it and see things but the way it works is they uh, put different objects around the edge and the pool will show them any connections between the objects so oh, you know if they're investigating a, a murder and they find you know, a bloody sleeve or something. And then, you know, they can take the uh, a dagger or some dirt from the alley where they found the, uh, the victim. And so that gives them visions that they can use to go out and investigate some more. So that's a sort of a cool, uh, and nobody understands how the pool works. It's been around for, you know, hundreds of years, and, but they, they get it and they can use it as, as sort of that, that helps because they don't have, you know, DNA or right. <laughs> all of that stuff. But Wire tapping or any right, of those right. skills. A lot of what they do is uh, just, you know, sort of the same sort of shoe leather stuff that people would do back in the, you know, noir uh, crime novels of the 30s and 40s. You know, there's following leads down and talking to people. And and so I, I kind of like having that, that crossover. And they do some, some crime scene investigation stuff too. Uh, so it's, you know, they're they're searching places and finding clues and wondering whether they're helpful or not. So uh, I try to do that sort of detective story, buddy cop thing, because they're, they all have partners that they work with. So there's uh, usually, and then there's the whole guild is also a team for them. So, um, but anyway, yeah, so that's, that's the focus of those, but there's a different mystery for each one. And some of the mysteries are big in scale, you know, with massive uh, important things going on and some are smaller. Uh, that people just get sort of tied up in and, and work on. So, and you follow the same characters? Um, no, actually, I, I, that's one thing that's different from other fantasy series. I actually have a different uh, narrator for each book um, because I, I kind of wanted to stay away from <laughs> what I think of as the John McClane problem. You know, after Die Hard, he probably wouldn't have had another big adventure in his life, but then Die Hard 2, he's on a plane. And then, yeah, you know, so that kind of thing doesn't keep happening to people. So I try to shift narrators. It also helps me keep it a little fresh too, because I get to explore different uh, people. So in the first book there, there's a narrator and then his partner and the narrator's uh, kind of a smaller uh, uh, nervous guy and his partner is this big strong guy. Uh, and they are sort of mismatched, but they're really good friends and they go around investigating together. And then for the second book, I actually wrote from the the perspective of the partner 
uh, the bigger guy. And so you get to see kind of what's going on in his head and he picks up another partner in that book. Um, and then uh, the Welling Glass I just did, there's a, a sort of a side character in the first two books that um, that becomes the narrator there. And I threw in a second narrator character who's a, a young apprentice at the school. So, so each book has a different narrator set at a different time, different case. And I try to make them all self-contained, you know, kind of like an Agatha Christie book or something like that would be where there's one mystery that gets solved over the case. Or, you know, John Sanford does that with the prey novels or that kind of thing. So you can read right. the book by itself or if you want to know what's going on in the city and see the characters progress, because sometimes the characters you followed show up again in the later books and, and play a role, but they're not the, the central characters. So that's yeah, a really so, good way to get to know each character and have a little bit more character development with each one. I actually did the same thing with my Kingdom Journal series. It's a YA urban fantasy, and there's a trinity of witches, and each witch tells part of the story. So the first witch starts the story from her point of view, and then you switch. The story continues, but then the second witch is telling from her point of view, and then it kind of went sideways. We had one of the evil villains that needed to tell his story in the middle. And then <laughs> the last one um, ends with the third witch of the Trinity tell it through his point of view. So they all have their individual character development, but the arc of the story is still there. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's such a neat design. I, I find that writing from a different voice is, is makes it all much more fresh to me than, um, than, you know, I really like each of the narrators as I go, but I, um, this most recent one, the narrator is actually kind of an annoying character from the first books. Uh, he's a he's the third son of a minor noble, and he's always sort of being snobbish. And so this book sort of explores what makes him tick, and and he goes on a sort of journey that <laughs> I couldn't write about an annoying guy the whole time. So he he uh, figures some stuff out, and becomes a better person over the. Oh, course. that's cool. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I really like. Uh, doing the different narrators in my sci-fi book I actually that's the first one I tried with dual narrators uh, and one of them is a, a smuggler's daughter who's visiting this planet and then aliens invade and she gets caught up in the invasion her ship crashes and and she's alone on this planet that she never expected even to kind of spend more than a day at um, and then the other narrator um, and I sort of split chapters the other narrator is one of the invading aliens who's uh whose goal is to take over the planet, except that she's a, actually a rebel within the, the aliens trying to sabotage yeah. them. So yeah, and that was really fun going back and forth, especially because they're, you know, they don't even know each other's worlds and they're uh, each acting within their own frame. So yeah, I really, I really enjoyed kind of branching out that way. That sounds really fun. I, I that sounds like a book I would definitely pick up and read right away. So do they become friends? Uh, well, I don't, don't want to spoil anything. Um, Okay. <laughs> it, it would be deeply unsatisfying if they never met each other. So yeah, uh, that, that actually was the most nerve wracking part of the book because I knew that the longer I waited to have them come into contact with each other, the more satisfying it sort of would have to be. Right. And, you know, I was writing that chapter and I was just sort of sweating, you know, like I have to get this right. They have to. Um, and because I was alternating chapters, I could show that meeting kind of from each one's perspective as, as they worked through. Uh, that but yeah that was super fun um, trying to figure that out there's a third character in there too who's not a perspective character um, who's uh, an AI on a ship from a, another alien race that plays a big role too so I almost have three central characters there but but I don't like right I don't I don't I don't think I could write one of these ones that has you know 150 characters and, and 20 points of view I bet those are I like oh yeah, I mean, at that point, yeah. you'd have to have a third person, yeah. one person who's telling the story that knows most of what's going on, right? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, The Willing Last, I, I tried, uh, that's the red one here, tried two different narrators, um, and that helped because the snobbish noble guy actually ends up leaving the city pretty early on, but I needed somebody to be telling a story of what's going on in the city after he left, so that really helped to have those two just in terms of the plot. And then I really right. got to like the second character too, the younger apprentice. So. Yeah, and it sounds like you like to write in first person as well. Yeah, um, the um, Daros is third person and um, the, the other four are first person except for the Wolling Lass. I actually split 
the chapters, which I know sort of annoys some people, but I thought it really worked. The noble is in first person, and then the young apprentice is in third person. Okay. Uh, and because it's splitting by chapter, it's not jarring. You know, you're not doing it within a chapter, but um, but I thought that helped set them apart a little bit. And it also, you know, the apprentice person is kind of finding her own way and full of doubt. And I don't know from a that is way overblown, and I don't deserve to be making artistic statements, but <laughs> um, but it seemed more more effective kind of for a person who's not quite comfortable in her body yet you know, to have it be told third person and then uh, the you know, totally self-confident noble guys in first person. Um, and I, you know, yeah, 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 it kind of fits their personalities as yeah, well, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Anyway, I, I tried to, I'll, I'll see. I just released it last week, so I don't know what people think. It, but. Well, I saw that you are a semi-finalist on Owen Awards. I, I didn't click on the link. I have to admit, SPSFC, isn't that... Yeah, That's so the, that. yeah, there are these, um, there are two really cool competitions that I've entered some of the books in. One is for fantasy. That's the self-published fantasy blog off, which has 300 books. And then it does sort of a round by round elimination. And I've entered a couple of the Inquisitor's Guild books in, in there. And then Daros, um, uh, Hugh Howey, who wrote Wool, he's a pretty famous uh, indie author. Um, he set up one for sci-fi. And so that one's going on now. And I put Daros in there. I think there were 344 entries that are all uh, kind of indie authors who are publishing their own stuff. Um, and those got split up into groups of 30. And then the groups of 30 got whittled down to 10 each and then three each. So I've, I've made it through a couple rounds there uh, with Daros. And uh, the competition goes for a year. So it doesn't finish up till July. But we're down to, down to 30 books out of the original 300 plus. That's so, really great. Congratulations. Yeah. And it sounds like oh. there's a panel of judges. Yeah, so it's actually both of the competitions are run by book bloggers. So just, you know, people who are enthusiastic about reading and reviewing books. And so those folks are putting in tons of time for no compensation, you know, just reading all of these books that uh, that come in. And so that's just a, a really neat community. Both of the contests have, have had really neat communities around them. The self-published fantasy blog off has been going on. I think it's on the seventh iteration now. So it happens every year and has gotten some steam. And then the, the SPSFC, uh, the sci-fi one, just started this year. Well, I'll um, have to get those links for you for all my listeners who are authors and might want to submit their books. Yeah, yeah. No, those, those have been so cool. And um, they're, they're all different kinds of uh, fantasy, you know, so it's not all epic or high fantasy, uh, which is more like what I'm doing. There's uh, fantasy romance and and you know uh, fae stuff like your things. I'm sure would be. They say <laughs> the judges can decide your book is not fantasy when they read it. Um, so I think some books have been you know eliminated by being, you know, kind of uh, sci-fi instead of fantasy or that kind of oh, thing. Okay. But yeah, but uh, there's no um, and there's no cost to enter. It's just a really cool oh, that is kind cool. of community-based thing. Both of them are that way. Yeah. Interesting. Well, and the bloggers get books to review because they like reading, number one. Right. But yep. number two, it would give them something to put on their website as well. So right. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of a win-win that way, right? Yeah, well, I hope so. I think, I think uh, you know, of course, you submit a book that you've already written. So there's not any work from that right. point on. The bloggers have to do all of this reading. That's you know, they, reading. they get a group of 30 books, then they're, they have to read at least a little bit of all of those, you know, pretty quickly. So it's a, it's a lot of work for them. That would be, um, yeah. Yeah. But they do get traffic to their websites and they get a place um, to post reviews that, you know, the whole bunch of people go and, and look at. So it actually, it does help, you know, I assume I haven't done it from the, the judging end, but they seem to have a good time with it too. Although sometimes <laughs> I think they get run a little ragged by all the, uh, all the books they read. Yeah. So that's interesting. You talked about the sci-fi versus fantasy in that line. What is the line in your mind? Oh, wow. That's the um, definition. That's tricky. Um, fantasy, you know, there, uh, there's contemporary fantasy, there's urban fantasy, there are all sorts of things that fall into that kind of big header um, that go well beyond the sort of traditional idea of, you know, elves or whatever. Uh, but uh, I think it just has to have uh, magic involved in some way so a sense of unexplained uh stuff going on that 
um, has that element. Um, I don't have monsters or non-human races in, in my books. You know, there are all sorts of things that are sort of typical fantasy elements, but your book doesn't have to have them really to, to be that. Um, and it doesn't even have to be set on a different world. You know, there's sort of a categorical distinction between second world versus our world. And both of them have really cool fantasy stories written in them. Um, you know, if you're writing something that's in the current world and doesn't have magic, then you're sort of more writing historical fiction or, or that kind of thing. So I think that would be the, maybe the cutoff there. I don't know, but I, I, I'm much more of a, <laughs> uh, in biology, they talk about lumpers and splitters when they're doing species. And this is the same kind of thing. I think anything could be fantasy if you, if you kind of think it is and, and hit some of the basic uh, guidelines. For sci-fi, it has to have some sort of technology that's beyond what we have now, um, but you can do that in the present day, you know, through uh, all sorts of scenarios, um, or you can do it set in the future. Um, but I think and that's not that different from the magic sort of thing that's central to me for the, uh, the fantasy books. So I think that makes it easy for me within my definition to kind of go back and forth. Yeah, my husband's a huge like sci-fi reader and he's only like hard sci-fi. Oh yeah. And if it strays a little bit, he's like, nope. He's like, that's not sci-fi. <laughs> <He's laughs> like yeah. sci-fi is something that ha could happen based on our current technology. Yeah. And so, and fantasy is something probably that could not happen based right. on our current technology. So he's very like strict with his sci-fi. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I actually, with, with Daros, there's some stuff that's, you know, alien technology that's beyond us. But even that, I have a, I uh, was a geology professor for a long time. I just stepped away from that. But I have a physics professor friend, and I had him go over the book and consult with me to make sure I wasn't doing anything too weird with, you know, gravity and black holes and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, right. He I, reads I don't my know book it, and he's so funny because he'll read The Martian and he'll read all the technical, he's an engineer, he'll yeah. read all the technical stuff and he loves it, right? And I read The Martian, I'm like, skim, skim, oh, the plot <laughs> line, right? And yeah. then he reads my book and he says, you're very detailed. I'm like, um, I, I think you like the detail in The Martian, right? Yeah. But I am describing the scene and the pretty green trees and the flowers yeah. and he doesn't care about that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a how cool the very wings look, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's one thing I've realized that readers are, you know, as different as authors. They they have their tastes, and sometimes something will totally work for one and not for another. And um, and so, yeah, that's that's one of the tricky parts with figuring out who your audience is, you know, and, and what you go with. I think uh, Daros is more the sort of space opera kind of thing. So less of the really strict hard sci-fi, but I did want to have it be, you know, it involves humans and it's set in a, it's not a galaxy far away. It's in our, you know, at least in our galaxy, but a couple thousand years uh, ahead. So, um, so you don't want to do anything. It's just ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> I say that and then I think of my book. Okay, you don't want to do too much. That's, uh, that's just I will weird. still put your book in sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a ship that has a cloaking system. And so I really wanted that to work. And of course, that's not something we can do quite today the way I want it. Although we have, you know, stealth planes and that kind of thing. But, uh, but that's one of the things that I tried hard with the physics professor to figure out, okay, I want this ship to be hidden. But I and that would mean, you know, energy emissions and all of that. But I want it to be in a way that isn't going to make people like your husband throw the book against the wall and say, yeah. oh, come on, you know. So. Um, so, yeah, I, I tried to do that, but um, I also didn't want to get lost in the details of the engineering because that's not what the story was. And I know there are plenty of authors for whom that is the like the Martian is very much a yeah. technical manual for how to survive on Mars, in addition to being a really cool story. So. And what kind of aliens are these? Can you describe them to us? Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. there are actually several different alien species in the book, but the main invading uh, aliens are called the Zeelin, and they exist in a society that uh, is has sort of taken Darwinian natural selection way too far. So they are hatched and they are indoctrinated with all the skills they need. So they show up as adults 
with full training, but almost no knowledge about how to, you know, <laughs> interact okay. with anyone. So yeah, um, their culture is on the uh, on their ships. They can be selected out. They can be culled for any reason by the captain. And so the captain on the particular ship that my character's on is really harsh and just executes people all the time and uh, has created this sort of atmosphere of total fear and almost despair on the ship. And that's kind of what my character is rebelling against is that whole uh, mindset and you know doesn't want her society to work that way. But she's stuck because she was hatched and became a navigator you know, within an hour of being hatched. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that's a it's kind of an out there sort of premise. They're they're kind of reptile. They have uh, one big eye, and uh, I, I don't know. I didn't. I wanted to leave some of it the imagination. So I I talk about their appearance and parts, you know, sometimes. And then obviously when the humans meet them, they you know look at them and see different features. But uh, but yeah, so they have tails. Um, they're also. Uh, very strong empaths so they can sense emotions which uh, the humans obviously don't have any experience with so whenever they meet up they're reading all of these emotions coming off the humans and using that to figure out you know what the humans are, are up to and so that's another interesting part of it especially for a society that's so you know completely violent and uh, almost despairing the empath part was a, an interesting thing to sort of throw in there. Yeah, it is. And I'm wondering how the rebel keeps her thoughts and feelings from the rest of them. Yeah. So she has a she has a masking device that keeps putting out sort of a bland kind of I'm with the fleet sort of <laughs> thing. So yeah, I knew I, I couldn't have that be or she'd be found out all, almost immediately. So she has that, but it's not perfect. And so that runs her into some trouble as she as she makes her way through it there. So interesting. Well, I yeah. love the I love these characters, and I'm gonna have to download Daros definitely. That oh, one's cool! To me. Well, I, I hope you like it. Yeah, yeah, that one that one was fun. I um, I I actually wrote it just from the humans' perspective, and I wrote the first I don't know six or eight chapters, and then I was like, this is missing something. I need to know, you know, what this is all about. And then I thought of the kind of writing from another perspective, and so I started adding in chapters from the aliens' perspective. But then I was thinking it would be really kind of less fun to write about a bloodthirsty just hostile person and so that's how i got the idea of the the rebel so uh that she'd be a little more sympathetic and you'd have somebody to cheer for over on the alien side too um, yeah it, it would humanize them right and give yeah. them like, yeah yeah yeah. Or, I, I, or else the the story arc would just have to be overcoming the alien invasion right, right? yeah uh -huh. and there yeah i tend to i like I don't like mafia movies. I, I always need people to cheer for. And so in my books, the you know, the people might have flaws, they might fail, but they're always people who are at least trying to do the right thing as they perceive it. And so I, I would have a hard time writing a an anti-hero or just a, a total villain, you know, who just wanted everything to suck. Uh, yeah, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to do that. I think your yeah. mind has to have a different switch or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, maybe as I, you know, keep writing and I might try something like that sometime, but I, I don't know, the books that I've always loved are the ones where, you know, you're really pulling for the the person or the people in the middle to, right. to kind of come through and, and get some work, get what they're doing. But you, you've written one from the perspective of the villain there in the middle of the series that, how did that go? Well, it, it, so it's interesting. So in book two, you don't know whether he's a villain or not. Oh, you okay. You suspect that he's a villain and on the bad side, but he kind of got under my skin and that's how he got his own book. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to give away whether he's the villain or not. Oh, okay. Kid, but, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's neat. The best bad guys or bad uh, gals whoever uh, those are the ones that you could write a whole book about because that means that you're making them complex enough and interesting enough that they have something interesting to say or to explore so yeah it's fun yeah. to do that because so I think I'm gonna have to keep writing prequels of prequels of prequels <laughs> of <laughs> because yeah. my fantasy theory is like an extension of the kingdom journals like yeah. the fae fantasy is an extension it's a crossover series 
and it, it we have the same bad guys throughout the whole thing but it's like how do those bad guys how did they become bad or why are right. they doing this evil to everyone and in my mind i have to have a reason for that i think some people can write psycho thrillers and their bad characters are just bad but yeah i don't have that mindset so i think i'm gonna have to write the prequel of this is why she ended up the way she ended up so. yeah yeah i mean there's there are villains in each of mine and i always try I, you know it's up to the reader how well i succeed but try to have them at least have a goal that makes sense for them in their world and right. be pursuing that you know in ways that they're willing to make the trade-offs you know obviously they don't put morality top if they're doing bad things but you know uh, so yeah that's 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 interesting it's hard to do as a writer you know you want there to be obstacles to your good guys and, and bad guys are great obstacles but um but making them also be real people is uh that's fun that uh, when you get it working and you figure out okay this is why they're doing it all but, of course, if we want a villain, we could just grab from the current headlines, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I won't say more about that. <laughs> yeah, that would have been true almost any time in the last two years, but very true now. Well, yeah, well, and throughout history, there's always yeah. been somebody invading somebody else that yeah, right. Right. maybe wasn't provoked. So we just won't go there. <laughs> yeah. This is my favorite question to ask all my authors. What do you want your readers, like overall, like no matter what book of yours they pick up, what do you want them to come away with or feel or think or from your stories? Uh, so uh, I want them to, that's hard. I just want them to have fun primarily, but- That's uh, an okay answer too. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, you know, I try to, I try to make the stories uh important to the the central characters and to show how they're making sacrifices and and you know being run ragged by their efforts to try to to do what they're doing and so if if i succeed in portraying that then they really are cheering for these narrators as they go um i also put a lot of uh <laughs> what i think is humor in my books my kids might not agree uh, but you know if they're if people are you know, laughing at my jokes when they come along. The books aren't just, you know, silly all the time, but um, but I do uh, I do like to, you know, mix up the kind of emotional high points with with some funny stuff or at least fun stuff. So um, I hope that people are able to enjoy that also. And, you know, and that it's the right mix because sometimes you are more into the, you know, the drama side and the jokes come in as a distraction or sometimes, you know, you're like, this book is too silly for me to care about. And so that is, uh, that's the balance I'm trying to strike. So if that works, then people will laugh, but also care, you know, I guess that, uh, that sounds cheesy, but that's, that's kind of what I'm after. No, I, I'm sensing a sprinkling of dad jokes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I started with my first book, making every chapter title a terrible dad joke. Uh, or almost every chapter, and I've done that now for uh, for all the others. So some of the chapter titles are very, they're anachronistic and um, uh, <laughs> so you know, in the most recent one, there's a, a scene where the young apprentice has to climb a building. And so I called that one, Ascent of a Woman. <laughs> you know, that, that, that level of kind of stupid uh, joke, yeah. And then, uh, when the alien and Daros is, remember they're called the Zelin, when she's uh, handcuffed to a, a thing, uh, I called it hooked on a Zelin, you know, so that's the level of kind of terrible joke that, I've, that I'm working with there. Well, that's a great tidbit from your, from your series and your book. <laughs> people may not know about you. So thank right. you for yeah. giving me that. I, I, yeah, I tried to do chapter titles for a while and they were just too hard for me to write. So I was like, chapter one, chapter two, that's good enough. I can't do titles. Yeah. Well, I think if I was doing them, you know, and trying to put serious, meaningful titles on, I would have, I would have no idea what to do because it just would seem so pretentious to call them, you know, something but when i am basically setting most of them up to be these terrible jokes then i i have fun with that it's actually it's the first thing i do after writing the first draft is i'll go back and each chapter i'll try to figure out okay what's the what's going to be the title for this and uh so yeah but some of them are um 
are really bad. Well, that sounds like <laughs> a lot of fun. And I didn't ask from the beginning, are these adult characters for the most part? Um, they're all young. Uh, uh, well, with the, the Grand's probably uh, 25, the noble guy is 25. And of course, the the Zealand character is an adult, but she's really only five, you know, because she was hatched as a fully functioning. So yeah, they're, they're typically young. Um, the youngest is probably the smuggler's daughter in the sci-fi one. She's 16, but not, it's not intended to be YA, you know, there's, okay. um, they're all, there's not um, a lot of <laughs> uh, heavy duty graphic romance stuff, but there is fighting and some uh, some violence and that kind of thing that goes on in them. So they're okay, so mostly yeah. adult readership then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, th I mean, you know, I anybody who's uh, excited about reading and is thirteen or fourteen could probably handle all of it. But um, but yeah, they're meant as uh, for an adult audience for sure. Okay, fine. Yeah, it was interesting because I was scrolling through TikTok the other day and they were talking about fantasy books and there could be like a, a lot of people just assume if it's fantasy it's YA or young adult or yeah, but yeah. they're like no you can have adult fantasy books that aren't erotic fa fantasy not right, that yeah. kind of fantasy but uh -huh. you know and I'm like okay thank you for saying that <laughs> <laughs> yeah very cool yeah I know I, I, you know as I've kind of explored doing this independent publishing thing you end up in these promos and half the books have naked torsos on them and and you know you're like oh this isn't this isn't what i'm trying to do at all uh and you know i know those those audience those books have huge audiences it's just that's not if people are looking for that that's not what they're going to find in mind so i had to kind of locate myself more squarely within that part of the genre that's not entirely about romance and you know i do have some you know, people longing for each other and that kind of thing. That's just part of being human. But yeah, I don't need to know. <laughs> but, you know, it's not that kind of, I guess. Fun, yeah. Uh, well, that. if you go on Book Funnel, they usually have good promos that like yeah. separate out the genres. So right. that might be something good for readers oh, for sure. and yeah. for and, us authors. And I, I learned about that after the first, you know. <laughs> <laughs> First. Yeah, that learning curve is not too hard, yeah. right? No. <laughs> yeah. No fun. So tell everyone where we can find your book. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, they're all on Amazon. So you can look for Inquisitor's Guild on Amazon or, or any of that. My site is davedobsonbooks.com. Uh, so if you can remember my name, you can get there. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are the best ways. I'm on uh, Twitter as GC Dave Dobson and then uh, I have a newsletter and a blog that are uh, accessible through my site. Um, and then just, uh, you know, I'm pretty easy to find that way. I uh, I did write the game Snood a long time ago. That would put me, for anybody who was playing computer games back in the early 2000s, they might have heard of that. Uh, but that's not much of a celebrity thing. But if you look for Snood, that's, that's me too. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for being here and we will have all the links in the description so people can find you. Okay, I really, I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful talking to you. You too, Dave, thanks. All right, thanks a lot.